from West Virginia Public Broadcasting. Support for the legislature today is provided by the following. AARP West Virginia, your ally for real possibilities in the Mountain State. Online at aarp.org slash wv. West Virginia University. Online at wvu.edu. At the legislature today, education takes the spotlight in both the House and Senate as lawmakers debate bills making changes in the state's K-12 system. Delegate Ron Walters joins us with his plan to reduce the number of county school boards. And it's been almost nine months since flooding took the lives of 23 people in the state. What lawmakers are doing to mitigate damage in the future and how one of the hardest hit communities is recovering. Coming up on the legislature today. I'm Ashton Mara. As lawmakers continue to work on the budget in the two finance committees, education issues are coming to the forefront on the floors. In the Senate today, lawmakers were set to amend a bill that requires the West Virginia Board of Education to adopt education standards from other states, specifically 1997 math standards from California and 2001 English standards from Massachusetts. The bill was laid over until tomorrow where it could face amendments on the floor, but Democratic Senator Bob Plymel had questions for Senate Majority Leader Ryan Ferns about the bill itself. Here's a portion of that exchange from the floor today. In the bill that you're a sponsor of, uh, says that we will repeal Common Core. We've already repealed it. That's already been done away with. Why would we have be redundant and put that in the bill again or, or any reason why we would do that? Uh, it's my understanding that the uh, smarter assessment part of uh, Common Core was uh, adjusted. Um, but no new standards were adopted and, and uh, felt that that was the error in no, the they, changes. Actually, that's not true. Uh, if you look at the current standards, they are the college and career readiness standards that have been uh, established through the Southern Regional Educational Board. Um, I don't think that a blanket statement like that that you just made is, is uh, actually uh, accurate and current. Is, is that a question? Y yes. I mean, what how could you make a statement item? like that when actually the, the, the college and career readiness standards are the ones that have been established by, through the Southern Regional Educational Board that we've uh, adopted, that the state board adopted? It's my understanding that um, these standards go back, to, uh, the, the standards that are adopted in this bill go back to prior to the adoption of Common Core. Uh, yeah, but the standards that are put forth in this uh, bill aren't even used in the states that they are referred to. For instance, the 1997 standards for California aren't even being used in California. And I mean, California is a very conservative state. I understand that. Uh, but that's not even being used now. It's my understanding that the bill includes the flexibility to, to, to use those standards as a baseline, but if changes have been made, that it allows the flexibility to update. Uh, I'm not sure that that's what the bill does. That it allow, allows more flexibility. I think we're directing the state board to use the standards that were established in 1997 in California and 2001 in um, um, Massachusetts. Again, that bill will be on second reading tomorrow in the chamber, the amendment phase. As of now, it's scheduled to be put to a vote in the Senate on Friday. At the start of this legislative session, Republican leaders warned that public education could be on the chopping block, seeing reductions that the system has historically been protected from. During a press conference earlier this week, both House Speaker Tim Armstead and Senate President Mitch Carmichael said they'll work to mitigate the harm to classrooms and teachers, but funding will be reduced. 
The House's education chairman says with those funding reductions, lawmakers are working to give county school systems more flexibility in how they spend their limited dollars. Liz McCormick reports. The House Education Committee is specifically looking for ways to give county school systems more flexibility when it comes to personnel. Members considered two bills today dealing with the issue. When county boards of education need to reduce the number of teachers they have on the payroll, they are currently required to use a lottery system to determine which teachers of equal seniority will be let go. House Bill 2569 removes the requirement for a random selection system. Instead, it requires the county boards look at a variety of factors, qualifications, critical need, or the National Board of Certified Teachers. House Education Chair Paul Espinosa of Jefferson County says that allows school systems to look at more than just seniority when making tough staffing decisions. A school district that might have finally filled uh, an AP calculus class or an advanced uh, chemistry class uh, with, a, with an educator uh, may be forced to uh, uh, terminate that employee through a reduction in force with no consideration given to the fact that you know those some of those positions are very very hard to fill and in some cases it may not be the most senior person but certainly an area that uh, you know a, a school district uh, given the opportunity would like to consider some of those factors. The Education Committee spent nearly an hour questioning counsel about the bill this morning, but recessed before coming to a conclusion. Chairman Espinosa decided to pull the bill from the committee's afternoon meeting and says his committee will take it up on a later date. The second bill the committee considered this afternoon, House Bill 2738, would give more flexibility to a public school system when it comes to teacher transfers. We believe it's prudent to allow that school district to have the flexibility within that calendar year to move that individual, if necessary, if it really makes sense for that school district, to move them to another role where perhaps their services are more needed. Sponsors of the bill say it will save schools money as enrollment changes and it gives a school the ability to make quicker decisions when a particular role needs to be filled. The bill passed out of committee this afternoon. The House Finance Committee also considered a bill today that began in House Education. House Bill 2637 allows retired teachers to return to the classroom when there's critical need or shortages. House Finance Vice Chair Eric Householder of Berkeley County says it's not a bill he and his colleagues are concerned would affect the budget crisis. No, it's not one of our efficiency uh, uh, issues that we're looking at, but keep in mind these retired teachers will be able to come back without any effect on their uh, current retirement, so we're not paying extra retirement benefits or anything like that, so I think it's a win for the taxpayers. Education Chairman Espinosa says allowing more flexibility for public schools in all three of the areas addressed by bills today is critical. Uh, as a direct result of the budget challenges that we're facing, uh, our school districts, uh, as well as our higher education institutions, you know, are struggling to, you know, uh, adjust to, you know, some of the spending reductions that we've had to enact in recent years. And, uh, you know, certainly uh, a, a common theme of legislation that we're taking up this legislation is to provide as much flexibility to our local school districts, uh, as much flexibility to our higher education institutions, so they can make the most efficient use of taxpayer dollars as possible. Legislative leaders announced earlier this week that the state's public schools will see funding cuts, potentially as large as 5% next year. House Finance Chair Eric Nelson of Kanawha County says he and his colleagues will be looking closely at where those cuts fall. As far as the details of exactly uh, what is coming from where, that's the process that we're going through right now, reviewing all three areas, um, you know, K through 12, uh, takes up 50% of our $4 billion budget. And uh, we're, we're very concerned about um, uh, the various counties and their needs. Lawmakers have a little over 20 more days left of this regular session to pass a balanced budget. State revenue officials have projected a budget deficit for the upcoming fiscal year to be as large as $497 million. For the legislature today, I'm Liz McCormick in the House. As members of both chambers continue to discuss funding reductions and flexibility for public schools, one delegate is looking to make a drastic change in the entire structure of the education system. Delegate Ron Walters is a Republican from Kanawha County. He introduced his bill into the House yesterday. Delegate, thank you so much for joining us today. Well, thank you for having me. It's a big bill that you brought here with you. Why 808 you, pages. <laughs> why don't you tell us what your bill does? Well, it eliminates 55 county boards of education, cre creates 10 school districts throughout the state, 
all about the equal size of 180,000 population in each area. It allows students to cross county lines. It combines the busing. It downsizes the uh, administrative staff. It um, shares uh, specialty teachers throughout that district. It uh, allows the levies to stay in place, but then over time deals with the levies in the different district. It eliminates the board as we bring up a district board. It gets rid of the recess and downloads its function. It sends some of those functions to WVU and to health departments for EMS training and firemen. It uh, takes virtually every part of the education system and develops a com uh, into a com combination and it saves $330 million. That's a lot of money, and I know that you all are looking for that kind of money to save, but tell me why. Why did you feel like now was the time to take on this kind of issue? You know, I've run for 24 years, and I've always asked, why do we have 55 of everything? And so with that frustration of hearing that from the public, it was time that we start to rethink education. It's the easiest part to do and develop 10 districts. That might not be the right number. It may not be the right number to have seven members on the school district and only a couple from each of the counties so you have equal distribution. It may not be the right time to download the function of the recess into that or download most of the function of the State Board of Education. But this bill gives us a track record to do it. And eight pages of this bill is nothing but the code it affects. Hmm. Wow. Talk to me about how the how this bill would impact the State Board of Education when you make these changes. Well, my idea with State Board of Education is to download some of the research function to the counties, but allow them to collect data and to analyze that data and see what works best within those districts. You know, they're each little test tube type things and that you can try something different. You know, the Eastern Panhandle and the Northern Panhandle are different. So is the Southern part of West Virginia. So that's why I created 10 districts so that they could specialize with their vocational training, different training that goes on. But what, what the crux of this all starts from the citizens. The citizens said, why do we have to have 55 of everything? Then how do, you, uh, how do you fight the pushback of West Virginians who say, well, I identify with my county. I want to stay with that county identity. How do you fight that? Well, we, what we did is we tried to create in this bill representation equally from each of the counties. So if you have a portion of a county or the whole county, that there will be equal representation on that new district board. So you're the, the sole sponsor of this bill. Do you really believe it'll get through the House this year? I don't think it'll get through the House this year. And this is about a six-year implementation period uh, to get this done. But it gives us the floor plan for a discussion, and we will have an interim study. Delegate Ron Walters, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. We take a look now at some of the House and Senate districts in the central part of West Virginia in this edition of Meet Your Lawmakers. Ron Miller is a senator from Greenbrier County. A Democrat, he represents the state's 10th senatorial district, a position he was elected to in 2010. Senator Miller is a Baptist minister who leads two churches in the Greenbrier Valley. He's a graduate of Shepherd University. Roger Hanshaw is a Republican from Clay County. He was elected to the House of Delegates in 2014 to represent the state's 33rd district. Hanshaw chairs the House Committee on Enrolled Bills. He also serves as a parliamentarian for the Republican National Committee and is an attorney. Brent Boggs was elected to the House of Delegates in 1996. He represents the 34th House District from Braxton County. A Democrat, Boggs attended Glenville State University and is a railroad engineer. Next week, West Virginia will mark nine months since devastating flooding in the south central portion of the state took the lives of 23 West Virginians, damaging hundreds if not thousands of homes and businesses. Many communities are still recovering from that flooding, but lawmakers in the House are attempting to take steps to make sure that future floods aren't as destructive. 
On June 23, 2016, West Virginia experienced some of the worst flooding in the state's storied history. During the past 52 years, 282 West Virginians have died in floods, including the 23 who perished last summer after historic water levels led to a federal disaster declaration in 12 counties. Nine months later, communities are still recovering from the high water. During a budget hearing in February, Department of Homeland Security and Emergency Management Director Jimmy Jeanette told lawmakers once the state reaches a damage estimate of $150 million, the Federal Emergency Management Agency will begin funding recovery efforts at a 90-10 match, with 90 percent of the funds coming from the federal government, 10 percent from the state. The current numbers, we're at about 53 percent of that. Uh, the schools are the big, uh, the big dollar factor involved here, uh, which will probably go close to $200 million uh, as we finish that out. Five schools were destroyed and students are largely still in temporary classrooms. Lawmakers in the House, however, are not waiting for those totals to move forward with plans to help mitigate the level of damage the state could face in the future. Lawmakers like Delegate Stephen Baldwin from hard-hit Greenbrier County. After the flood, I, I found out that there had been a flood protection bill you know, sitting on the shelf for years, and like everybody else, I was floored. Baldwin is talking about a 2004 flood protection plan, the product of a 26-agency task force developed to respond to flooding in the state. Delegate Brent Boggs says he remembers when the 365-page document was presented to the legislature. And I know that it was, it was certainly a comprehensive document, several hundred pages, and it had a lot of good recommendations, but like a lot of things in state government, it was produced, but a lot of it was shelved. After the 2016 floods, interest in that shelved document reignited from House Speaker Tim Armstead in particular, whose hometown of Elkview experienced its highest level of floodwaters in nearly 100 years. Armstead says that's why he's introduced House Bill 2935 to implement the recommendations of the 2004 report. We know we can't prevent them, but there are things I think we can do to lessen the blow of flooding, uh, to make sure people are well uh, advised of when a fl flood is about to occur, and to really just learn from the things we've learned through these disasters. Armstead's bill creates a state flood protection planning council made up of representatives from the Division of Natural Resources, State Conservation Agency, Department of Environmental Protection, and others. Its chair would be required to report quarterly to a new interim legislative committee on flooding. Armstead approached several members of the chamber from flood-affected areas to join him in sponsoring the legislation, including Baldwin, who says the communication portion of the bill to him is key. In our experience in Greenberg County, um, communities were literally cut off from one another by the water and there was no power, um, there were no phone lines, there was no good way to communicate with one another. And so what we were lacking from a governmental and non-governmental perspective, you know, churches and nonprofits, was the ability to coordinate and communicate in terms of our flood relief efforts. Delegate Jordan Hill from Nicholas County is also sponsoring the legislation. His home county was one of the 12 named a federal disaster area. Traveling through Nichols County and specifically my district of Birch and Birch River, um, there, were, there are now homes that are they're gone, businesses that are gone, um, and uh, to to have the speaker to ask me to be on this bill is is an honor to, to be able to do so. Armstead says his flood protection legislation has bipartisan support this year, and he believes it will make it through the legislative process this session. We may have disagreements on other issues, but when it comes to protecting our citizens from natural disasters like this, I think we, we all work together. And as I said, these pieces of legislation are bipartisan, uh, and I think they, they'll have great support on both sides of the aisles. Boggs, who is a sponsor of the bill, says even though his district wasn't impacted by the 2016 flood, all of the state's 55 counties have been affected by high water at some point. So I think that uh, we need to really get on board with this and then provide a legislative uh, mechanism to work with all of the entities, pull out the flood plan again, and then go over it jointly and make sure that we implement just as much as we possibly can and make the citizens aware, make the counties aware, and uh, let the state know that we're doing our job. Armstead's bill has been referred to the House Government Organization Committee, but hasn't been placed on an agenda so far this session.
We turn now to one of the communities most affected by that flooding for an update on their recovery process nine months later. Bob Henry Baber is the mayor of Richwood in Nicholas County, which was named a federal disaster area in July, just over a week after the storms. Mayor Baber, thanks for making the trip to Charleston to see us. My pleasure. Good to see you again. How are things in Richwood? Give us a general update. Where do you guys stand in the recovery process? Well, I think the town is coming along fairly well. You know, we've, uh, we, um, we've got tiny houses popping up like mushrooms. We've got uh, 30 new homes being built. We got that huge uh, grant from the Federal Home Loan Bank. Uh, $750,000 of that is coming to Richwood. They're going to double it with labor. So altogether in Richwood, which, which has not had a new house built in it in 30 years, we're going to get 30 brand new $100,000 homes for flood victims. We're going to upgrade 40 homes up to $15,000 each. 90 uh, homes that were flooded or substandard are being cleaned up and t taken out. So um, on all those levels and on the infrastructure of the city, we're moving along quite well too. But we have a long, long, long way to go. Remind us what, what the damage was in Richwood in terms of the number of people or homes, in terms of dollar amounts to infrastructure. How did Richwood fare? Uh, you know, you know I, we talked before about the Doppler front, and I have that picture in my office, I think you saw it, which actually, you know, the front, we had a little bubble over here, Clendenin, which got hit really hard, and then Birch River, and, but the front, actually, the heart of it was over Raynell and White Sulphur Springs, about 25 miles south of Richwood, which was a very lucky thing for us. We would have lost probably 95 people in our nursing home who were rescued by citizen volunteers and EMS and staff. So in terms of life, we feel really blessed. We got 12 inches of rain, so did White Sulphur Springs. But if that front had been over the high mountains, you know, Richwood's a bowl, would have backed up against those mountains. We probably would have had 20 in our, and we probably would have had significant loss of life. So ultimately, we were, we were blessed. However, in terms of infrastructure, no town got hit as hard as uh, Richwood. Uh, everything on FEMA is like project work orders. It's broke out by claim, and it's like different, like if your house was burnt down, it would be like the bedroom, the bathroom, it's all that way. So Richwood has, at the moment, 23 project work orders, and the town closest to us, I believe, has four or five. So you can see, in terms of infrastructure, we had about five times more damage than anybody else. We're looking at about $10 million of infrastructure damage to the city. That does not include houses. Now, Richwood also lost two schools in the process, both Richwood Middle and Richwood High School. Uh, talk to me about what's happened with those kids right now, where they are, where they're taking classes, and, and the <coughs> process since then, because it's, it's possible that Richwood might not get those schools back. Well, it's possible, but we surely hope that does not happen, and you know, Mr. Justice has said it's not going to happen, and we're, we're hoping for justice in Richwood. Uh, the middle school was, and I want to give the superintendent some, some credit here, she, I, I, we've fallen out over time, but in the beginning I thought she was very adept at spinning the middle school students into Cherry River, and then she found an elementary school in Craigsville and, sp and spun the Richwood High School students into that school and got everybody into school, actually in time, which was a pretty remarkable feat. Mm -hmm. At that time the superintendent and the Board of Education also said, over our dead bodies will these schools not come back to Richwood. But since then, they've headed south on us. So they got sold on the big money and uh, moving everything over to, to uh, Somersville. And um, frankly, we are resisting that uh, strongly. I think the governor's with us. We hope the State Board of Education is with us. Is gonna, they have now ruled five to nothing to, to consolidate. Um, frankly, FEMA's mission is to restore the affected community. The affected community is Richwood, West Virginia. We are doing fairly well, but they have the rough price tag is being thrown around. This is still not really set on, but for Richwood High School and Middle School is $100 million. It's huge money. And it's also the heart and soul of the town, frankly. The Lumberjack Express, the, the band, everything about it. Our town is, you know, our town is a 49% unemployment rate before the flood. And we lost the nursing home, our largest employer, 130. Yet, even with that 49% unemployment rate, we had a 98% graduation rate. Now, you can't find another school like that in the United States of America with that kind of poverty and that kind of graduation rate. So we want our schools, we're gonna fight for our schools, and we're gonna, we're gonna get our schools. We have just a few moments left, but is there a sense of hope in Richwood after all of this? Oh, I think the people are very, I think what, in terms of the housing, and I think the people are still very optimistic about the schools, and I think a lot of that's attributed to Mr. Justice. You know, he's given us a big shout out. Um, 
We know I, we know I, we need our school. We're going to crawl back if we if we get our schools. We're going to stand up and sprint back, and they are the heart and soul. So I think the people are guardedly optimistic. I will tell you that the school board voting five to nothing to take our schools away um, has put the t town over the line on, in terms of flood PTSD. I myself did not cry for the first seven months of the flood. I've had a real hard time not crying here. And I have cried, and, and, and I've seen many, many people cry. It's just been kind of insult to injury. Mm -hmm. uh, mayor Bob yes. Henry Baber, Mayor of Richwood, we thank you so much for your time. We wish the best for your city. Oh, thank you so much for having me. This has been the Legislature Today. I'm Ashton Mara. Thanks for joining us. Support for the legislature today is provided by the following. AARP West Virginia, your ally for real possibilities in the Mountain State. Online at aarp.org wv. West Virginia University. Online at wvu.edu. From West Virginia Public Broadcasting.